All right, so I'm going to do a short review of what we covered last week, and then we didn't quite go through last week's outline. We're on the very end of that, so we're going to finish that up. And then I'm going to get into some of the questions that were asked last week. We had some good questions asked. Uh, that frankly, as usual, you guys asked some questions that I'm not really ready for, because they don't occur to me when I read the parts that I prepared for, but they occur to somebody. Uh, and they're relevant questions, so and usually good ones. So I had some fun times this week reading up on angels and demons and spirits and all that fun stuff. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. But let's uh, start like we usually do with the word of prayer. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are the author and creator of the heavens and the earth and everything in them. And we give you glory and honor and praise for that, that you are our creator. Not only that, but we are so thankful that you didn't stop at creating us, but that you sustained creation and then redeemed creation in Jesus. Be with us today as we continue to study your word, learn more about you, and be better able to share our faith with others so that they too may come to know the joy and the love of Jesus. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, so... We talked about the first article last time, first article of the Apostles' Creed, which is where we're at. Does anybody want to kind of take a shot at summarizing some of the things we talked about last week? See how well you all were paying attention. Although, huh? God created. God created, right? So we talked about in the, the there's three articles to the Apostles' Creed, and each one focuses on a different part of the Trinity. Who are we focusing on in the first article? God the Father, right? And his act, as Karen pointed out, of creation is the main theme here, right? Uh, and so the first article is actually really short. It's, I believe in God the Father, almighty maker of heaven and earth, right? So we talked a little bit about how some of the attributes of God the Father, right? We say that he is almighty, which means that he is all-powerful, right? Um, which kind of comes with the territory of being able to create all things, uh, and then we focused a little bit on um, different forms of faith in a God. So we talked about uh, materialism. And often people think materialism is an atheistic view. Uh, it basically sets material or the material world in the place of God, right? So materialism assumes that material matter is eternal, right? So that holds that eternal spot. We talked about pantheism, which is that God is what? Everything, everything and everyone. And then we talked about deism, which means that God exists. And what did he do? What's his relationship with creation? Nothing. He created it and then he stepped away, right? So that's the, the way that I remember that is the watchmaker God theory. That he's made the watch and set it on its course and then he just left. Um, what's the big thing in Christianity that automatically rules that out? Yeah, Jesus came into the world, right? If God had no relationship with the world and the universe after he created it, where did Jesus come from, right? Um, and in our view of the way things kicked off in the Garden of Eden, we would be in serious trouble if it was the watchmaker God because the watch stopped working the way it was supposed to very quickly after it was made. And it needed to be fixed. All right, then we started talking about Genesis chapter 1. So you might as well go ahead, and if you've got a Bible with you, open up to Genesis chapter 1, because we're going to be spending some time in there again today. So for those of you Bible scholars out there, Genesis 1 is at the beginning of the Bible. In fact... That's what that word means. The genesis of something is the beginning of something. Right? So I'm sure that that is the most profound piece of knowledge that you've heard today. <laughs> so treasure that and store it away. All right. So we were talking about Genesis chapter 1. So let's spend some time reading through that chapter, okay? So in the beginning... There's that Genesis beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, so that's verse one of the whole Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
Okay. Now, right now in the next verse is where we begin to see the theme of all of creation and a little bit of one of the attributes of our God is that he takes things from a state of disorder into a state of what? Order. Order, right? So the earth, so as we said, he created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And we had a couple of questions, pretty good questions related to that. Uh, and Maggie saved us from some, some confusion there um, by looking at the order of those things are written in the verses, right? Uh, so it isn't that darkness was an uncreated eternal thing or the face of the waters was an uncreated eternal thing. It was part of the creation of the heavens and earth. And this is describing where it started before we get to the days of creation, right? So this is like the disordered stuff of cre creation of the heavens and the earth. And what we're about to go through is how God sets that in order. Does that make sense? Okay. Now we don't know exactly why that's the case. You know, why it was just sort of disordered stuff. Um, but I guess, you know, if you're thinking about if you're going to make a clay pot, what do you do? First, you get the, the clay, right? And it's not molded into the shape yet, right? So it's just the disordered stuff that is going to become a clay pot. So this is a similar, similar thing, right? That the heavens and earth are created, but they're created as just the disordered material, that is going to be used to bring order to the universe through the, the subsequent days of creation. Does that sort of address your question from last time, Mark? Good deal. Um, okay. And then, of course, verse 3, and God said what? Let there be light. So we talked about how God creates. He creates through speaking. Right, so he brings order to this chaos through speaking it into existence. Um, and so, uh, one of the things that that I like to draw a connection to is this word that's being spoken right now is the very same word that says you are mine in baptism. It's the very same word that says this is my body and this is my blood. Right, this is the very same word that pronounces the forgiveness of sins to you. And we talked a little bit about this, I think, a couple classes ago, maybe a couple months ago, that God's word is autogeneric, genetic, that it generates, it creates within itself. So he speaks and it, it, it becomes a thing. So I always like drawing that connection because I think that's a really cool way to think about those promises in Jesus, is that they literally make the thing they're promising a reality. So in baptism, when God calls you his child, when he places his name on you, he's literally making you into a new creation. That's what his word does, right? And that's the, that's the way that Luther expresses that, right? That the old Adam is drowned and die and the new is born, right? And that new, that new you, that new creation is being made by God's word, right? All right, so first he starts with light, separates the light from the darkness. So what is he in effect creating there? We talked a little about this last time. Day and night. And what do we use day and night to measure? Time. time, right? So prior to the heavens and the earth, when there's only the eternal God, there is no time, right? So time is a created entity as well. Um, and if you don't believe me, then just try to imagine yourself outside of time. What would that be like? You're asking a person with a limited brain to have to answer something that God understands. Right. So there's, there's a reason, presumably, we would say, why this is day one of creation and mankind is not. Right? He's creating an ordered universe in which the creature of mankind is to exist. Right. So we're not meant to exist outside of that. So uh, C.S. Lewis is fond of saying, that when Jesus comes along, he does something even greater than the original. And so he would say he's doing that. One, right, we're being adopt adopted as children of God, no longer mere creatures in his image in our relationship with God and Jesus. But now also, 
part of our nature in the new heavens and the new earth is going to be changed because we're going to be living immortal lives, right? Okay. Um, let's see. So then you get at the end of each day, there was evening and morning the first day, right? So we had to start with light and darkness. So I just wanted to re-highlight that, that part of Genesis 1 because we were talking about that like last week. Yeah, Pete. Interesting point. Um, if the earth was without form and void, and it says he created the heavens and the earth, but that was before he said let there be light, and that was the first day. How long was this? No, no, no. How, how long was this darkness over the earth formed before he said, let there be light? Who knows? Okay. <laughs> um, so the question, the question Pete asked was, um, because there doesn't seem to be an indication of time until after the creation of let there be light, how long was the time where it was just the heavens and the earth and the darkness hovering over the face of the deep? And the, the answer to that is, who knows? We don't know, right? But which kind of gets at, we had a little slight discussion about the age of the earth theories among Christian groups last week. And another reason why I think that that's really not a point worth dwelling on. Because there's all kinds of different ways that God could create the earth in order to appear any sort of way he wishes. You also have an example that Pete raises here where this could have been millennia, could have been millions of years, who knows, because time wasn't really a thing then. Um, so, it, it, so it's best to focus on what we do know, which is what we typically do as Lutherans, right? Martin Luther says, don't dwell on the hidden God, he's hidden for a reason, right? Well, let's, let's look to what he has revealed to us. Any other questions about that first part in Genesis there was no time before that. That's where our limited brains can't picture right. no time. Right. right. Well, time is more known. Time as we know it. But you, you could go down a rabbit hole of really, really hard intellectual thought about all the different ways people can define time. But as, as we with a limited brain try to define time in a linear sequence, you're right, there was no time, but there are other ways to define time that are a whole lot more heady. Yeah, but I, I think that I think that Maggie's point is still a good one. God that, is outside of time. Yeah, correct. He was there before there was time. Well, he's not constrained by time. Yeah. yeah. Doesn't this doesn't the statement he was there before time actually mean there was time? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, so we would say that, that I think that's what you're saying is before the creation of time, which was a particular point in the continuum of eternity, which is what we are living in, right? That God was there before that, right? Um, and so, like, you do get into some difficult things with time because you can even talk about things like consciousness. So, like, if you've ever been in a van for 17 hours and you fell asleep, for the vast majority of it, <laughs> right? When you wake up there, does it feel like you've been in a van for 17 hours? No, right? It sort of feels like you might as well have fallen asleep five minutes ago. Uh, and so, you know, you get into discussions about consciousness. You can also get into discussions about like one of the aspects of sin uh, bringing death into creation is that it creates this degradation over time that was never intended. So how do you measure time when nothing is degrading so it's like not even it's like so hard for us to imagine like what what is it going to be like to like not ache and grow old to just remain perpetually the same for eternity right like and as we pointed out as soon as you start thinking about that the limits of our capacity to understand that thought become pretty apparent right because even if i try to describe something like that I'm always going to be describing it from the point of view of being in time. Right. You know, Bob, Isn't the psalmist somewhere saying that um, to God that like a year could be like a day to him? You know, so even he doesn't even think of it like the again, yeah. his wisdom is way right. higher than ours. Well, then you can you can also get we're going to be spending, I'm just we're just going to wade into this because we're going to be spending a lot of time in fun speculation land today. 
Um, but uh, yeah, Bob pointed out that the psalmist says that that a thousand years is like a day to God, right? And some people have used that to describe the six day creation as something other than six days. But we would say that day one, he creates day and night, and then specifically calls out evening and morning. So we would say it doesn't apply there. But as far as God's perception of time, that's totally true. And what, what's the psalmist trying to say is that God is not a being constrained by time. So, and this is where things start to get really kind of crazy. Like, imagine God being able to sort of look at you and you can see every single point of time in your life all at the same time. Right, so then you start imagining about like, well, why didn't God answer my prayer a certain way? Or why did he let this thing happen to me? Well, because he can see your whole life all at once, you know, and things like that. Um, and that's just a, a way we could possibly understand. I don't know if that's exactly for sure how he interacts with us, but, you know, the possibilities essentially are limitless, which is why we tend not to spend so much time on those sorts of thoughts. Um, do what? No problem. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> Not a lot of time. Okay. Any questions about that? Oh, many. <laughs> <laughs> I should have said, any answerable questions about that? I should specify. I should have known better with this week. Okay. Um, so we are on, if you've got your outline from last week, we're going to talk about how God sustains his creation, which is the bottom of the back page, letter D. Um, let's see, can someone open up their Bibles and read Colossians 1, 16 and 17? And then a second person, Maggie, you got that one? And then Russ, can you look up Genesis 1, 26 to 28? It's at the beginning of the Bible. All right, Maggie, go for it. Verse 15 says we're talking about... Uh, the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. All right. So how does God sustain that which he created? According to Colossians, there. It says in him. Right. So, in other words, God has an intimate connection with his creation all the time. Right. So, it's not, it's almost as described here. You can see where somebody might jump to pantheism, right? Where he's describing that. Uh, that he is within creation, that it finds its order in him. Now, that's different than saying it is him. Right? Um, but what's being expressed there is God is, has a deep connection not only with the creation of the everything, but also with its continuance. Okay? All right, and the Genesis 1. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. All right, so what part does God give man in sustaining his creation? What does he tell them to do to creation? Take care of it. Have, have dominion over it to subdue it, right? Um, and in the biblical language, when you have dominion over something and when you subdue something, it does not mean lord it over, right? We learned that from Jesus. It means to serve in a self-sacrificing manner. And so that's what humans are meant to do, right? We're the original caretakers and gardeners of creation, essentially, right? So actually, weirdly enough, we have quite a bit in common with the tree hugger types in that we believe that we have a, response, a moral responsibility to care for created nature, right? 
Now, when we, we diverge from them when they get into things like naturalism, which would say that humans, weirdly enough, we have this responsibility to care for creation, but we're no different than it. That we have no intrinsic yeah. dignity set upon by God, which is an odd position to hold, because otherwise, what's, what's the reason for us having dominion over things? Other than we're just the smartest thing that came out of evolution, I guess. Um, but the reason we diverge from there is they would say, like a, like a true naturalist would say, that the death of an animal, dog, wolf, elephant, whatever, is of the same value as the death of a human. Right? So that's where we can have a culture where we habitually kill our own young, and then nobody gets enraged about that. And everybody gets enraged when some guy shoots a lion half a world away. Okay? Um, the part of that thought process is this naturalism which always sort of struck me as um, if you've seen the matrix, the way agent Smith describes humans as like a virus wow. that are killing the, the world. And, and if you think about it, how many movies have you seen that have been made in the last three decades that depict humanity essentially as that like we're like part of nature, but not part of nature because we're the thing that's killing nature. Right. And not to say that we don't, we don't have, like, we can cause a lot of harm to nature because we have been given dominion over it, right? Um, but not in the same way that the world typically does. Okay. So our responsibility is to be a, and that's, some people argue as well, that's a part of the reflection of being made in the image of God. Part of that reflection is our dominion over other things, right? Now, obviously that dominion became corrupted by sin like everything else. So we don't exercise it the way we ought to, um, but that's part of that. Okay, um, let's see. What is the shape and direction of our lives in our Father's creation? Let's look at Psalm 100. I have that one. Pastor. You got it, Cheryl? Can you read it for us? Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyous songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. All right, thank you. So what is the shape and direction of our lives in the Father's creation according to Psalm 100? We are a sheep. He is his shepherd. And he is our shepherd. Yeah, that's part of it. Care. He takes care of us. What is our reaction to that care? What was the tone of that song? Joy, praise. Joy and praise, right? So part of the shape and direction of our lives in Father's creation is to be joyful at the blessings and the care that he exerts for us within creation. Now, even though that that has gone astray, we've gone astray, <coughs> is that still true? Yes. Yeah, right? Um, the, uh, a good example is the story of Noah. Right. What does it say about the world prior to the flood? Do what? Well, that that God essentially does not prevent the evil in the way that He normally does. So people are given into their own passions, and then the flood is is the way of wiping that away. So what that tells us is that God's normal procedure with creation is that He's constantly battling evil on our behalf within creation. Right? So in other words, like if you think it's bad now, imagine if God was not doing that at all. Right? And believe it or not, you and I were agents on his behalf in the world. Right? Which is, is a really kind of cool thought. That, that we are in his you know, hands and feet in certain senses um, in that fight. Right, which is why we're going to talk about the angels and demons stuff today. One of the clarities of scripture, which I think bears really well for some of the particular discussions we've had on confronting the effect of sin in different people's lives, is that they, those people, are never our enemies. What is our enemy? The powers of darkness, right? Sin and Satan. And, the, and the, the angels that serve him, right? Um, that those are the things that we're fighting against. 
that when sin became a part of creation and those angels were cast out of heaven, those are the forces behind all the things that we see. And that's what Jesus came to fight and defeat, and he succeeded. And now he has called us to continue that fight until he returns to make everything new. Right? Which is kind of a cool thought because it raises the level of what we're doing. Because a lot of the temptation is that we think a lot of the stuff we do is mundane. Like today, we're all sitting in a fellowship hall at a church building learning about God's word. And just a moment ago, we were sitting in a pew hearing about God's word being spoken and receiving his gift. None of those things are mundane in the spiritual battle that we're engaged in. God, God's opponents don't want you to be in his word because that's what fuels you and enables you to actually engage in that fight to begin with. Right? So we're doing some pretty cool stuff here. All right. Uh, 1 Timothy 4. You got that, Bob? The Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciousness have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry in order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. All right. So what is the shape and direction of our lives and our Father's creation according to 1 Timothy 4? Receive with joy, thanksgiving, the things that he gives us. Okay. So we're to receive with joy, right, the things that he gives us, right? Verse 4 says, for everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected. So notice at the end of Every day of creation, Genesis 1, 1 is one of the phrases that's repeated every time. And God saw that it was good, good right? <clears throat> Where's the first instance of something being not good? Man was alone. Man was alone, right? Uh, in the creation of man, he said, is very good. That's even beyond good. No. <laughs> right. So it was made in his own image. Um, and if it is to be received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer, right? So um, God's word and prayer make sanctify creation. Right? Um, but what does it also tell us about what part of what's going to be what's going to be a part of our life and, and our what's going to be a part of our life in our Father's creation? Sorry. Deceitful spirits and teaching of demons. Yeah, deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, right? Or in our, our epistle reading today that I preached on, the first thing it says is not every spirit is from God, right? And so there's now because creation has fallen, part of what the shape and direction of our life is going to look like is confronting those things, being at odds with those things, right? Which would be scary if we didn't have who on our side? Jesus, right? So, okay. Any other questions about that before we move on? Yeah, Cooper. So, <clears throat> it's, it's interesting when we talk about the act of God, right? And as opposed to deism, the, the watchmaker. Um, it, but it, it is hard for, you know, maybe some people that... that don't have that faith and they kind of blame you know they see the negatives right that go on so how could we articulate um like how do we know which which things really are the good things that god actually did actively as opposed to like oh maybe it's just dumb luck you know because that, i think to, to a lot of people you know there's a lot of suffering that, that people can endure that uh you know they they don't really understand how that would fit in right how does this demonstrate god's mercy and and, you know, it's interesting because the Bible speaks so much about helping the underdog, you know, and helping the orphan and the widow and so on. And, you know, and yet there's always shortcomings, right? So how do we, how do we marry those two? Yeah, so the, the I'm going to try and summarize, so correct me if I misunderstand your question. 
it seems like the, the heart of that question is how do we talk to people who maybe don't have the same view of God as we do, especially the active view, when how do we determine what like good and evil are happenings in the world where God is active and where he's not? Yeah. Essentially, right? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, for the good stuff, we know the answer is always God, right? So the, the scriptures tell us that he, he brings rain on the just and the unjust alike, right? So if you have a friend or a family member who's complaining about such and such person in their life who they know is doing bad stuff and they seem to get all this nice stuff in response, they actually are, the Christian response is supposed to be joy to, some, to that to a certain extent, right? Because it's a way of glorifying the mercy and, and grace of God, that he's even showering things on those who don't deserve it. Right, which of course is true about who else? Us, right? Um, but there is uh, there is also an element to that question. I actually just had a conversation with somebody about this this week that we would call what's called the problem of evil. It's kind of the root of that discontent, which is that if you have an active God who's all powerful, why is there suffering? Okay, um, and there is no good answer to that question. And if anybody ever claims there is one, I can almost guarantee you they're lying to you, right? Um, because that's another one of those things that requires knowledge outside of our bounds in order to answer clearly. Right? Um, so for example, like things that I might say are evil, may be a trial that God puts me through in order for a greater good later down the line. And maybe it's not even for me, but for somebody else who I don't even know, right? But I don't have the capability of seeing things on that level and understanding things to that degree. And so to me, I might be tempted to say, this is some unnecessary evil that serves no purpose. Right? Um, and God is saying, it is serving a purpose. You just can't see it. Trust me. Right? Um, and that's sort of like the message in Job. They, well, our sin didn't serve his purpose in the first instance. And it's a manifestation of evil. I mean, that's really what it is. It's a manifestation of evil. Bad things that happen to all of us. I mean, we all know that. I'm just saying that's, that's what right. I try to explain to you, but it's, it's hard to, it's hard because you can't rationalize that. But I think the, the question is deeper than that. So, like, I think people understand there's inherent brokenness in some form or fashion, even if they don't have religious words to, to describe it. But what they're asking is, like, you, you're a part of a religion, you Christian, who believes in a, a, a totally loving, all-powerful, like, constantly around God. If that's true, then why do hurricanes happen and people die? If that's true, why did my brother get cancer at 36 and die? If that's true, why did my parents get a divorce? If that's true, then you feel whatever you want, right? Um, and it is a good question. And the trouble with that good question is that the answer is beyond our bounds. And so the answer is actually trust God. That is the answer to that question for the human creature. Um, and in a way, it actually points us back to the original sin in, in the garden. Because what was the temptation to disobey God in the garden? How many, how many snap it was that God was withholding something from them. Okay, that's part of it. But what did what did he hook them in with? What did he tell them what happened? Between you'll know the difference between. Yeah, and you will be like God, God, right? So the temptation from the very beginning was for us to do stuff that's outside of our created ability to handle. So we took on a responsibility that we aren't equipped to actually do, right? And, and so this is a sort of question that that gets into that territory as well, right? Mike's in. I was just going to point out that I mean, when you're faced with, if you're faced with somebody asking a question like that, right? Really, it's not an opportunity to debate uh, theology. It's it's an invitation to empathize with the person, right? I am sorry that you're feeling that way. Whatever their emotion is, and you know. I'm not sure that there's any win there because you're not going to make them feel better. You know, perhaps the only thing that you could say is, 
where would we be if there were no God at all in this situation? We would be far worse, right? And, you know, for me, um, I, I just have to, to trust God and he helps me persevere in these situations. But that's not going to make you feel any better. Well, the answer is satisfying for a person who already has faith, but for a person who does not, it's not, right? Right. And so when we're dealing with somebody who, because there's a lot of instances like that when you're talking to somebody who's not of faith, your statements to them are going to preclude an assumption of faith. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And to them, they're going to be like, well, I just don't believe that. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And in that sense, it would be an unsatisfying answer. But above all, like usually when people ask questions like that in particular, one is because they're suffering and they want somebody else to know. And two is they're sort of begging the question. They want you to try and come up with an answer so that they can say that that's not true. And they're not doing that because they hate you, but they're doing that because that's their way of also getting you to suffer with them in that lack of knowledge. Right. It's almost like a, a weird self-preservation like i can't be the only one who doesn't know the answer to this this thing that's plaguing me and so i want you to to be a part of that now what do we do as christians is is as mike said you trust in god right not only for you but for them as well and so what do i do i would share with them the things that i do know about god trusting that those things, that that word of God, as we've been describing, is capable of creating the very faith which they need within them. Right? Not my snappy answer, but uh, I mean, I had a, I had somebody ask me a question like this. They were asking uh, uh, it wasn't this exact question, but it was a similar one, which was, um, how do we know what happens to babies um, who die before they're baptized or like? You know, how does faith work in babies? Um, and we would say from the scripture, we can know that a baby in utero can have faith because of, of the John the Baptist reaction to, to Mary when she's pregnant with Jesus. Right? And they say the Holy Spirit caused him to leap in her womb, right? And so we tell, like I will tell parents, read the scriptures to your children when they're in utero. Right? They, they hear that, right? And and we don't rely on faith being like a cognitive assent, but a gift from God. So it doesn't matter if you're two months in the womb or, or 97, you get faith as a gift from God the same way. But there's a lot about some of that that we don't know. And he asked about a particular element of that, and I told him that. I said, you know, here's what I do know, but there are parts of that that I don't. Because he followed that up with a question of, like a similar question because his question was really wasn't so much focused on the baby part but it was focused on like what about people who basically don't have an opportunity to hear the gospel because he followed that up with a question about well what happened to all the humans who lived on the continent of north america when jesus was alive and never had an opportunity to hear about it i have no idea i don't know and the weird thing was that was the answer that was most shocking to him now, he told me actually that nobody's ever said that to him when he asked that question. They always try to come with the answer. I didn't have one. I mean, there isn't one. I don't know. Because um, I know that I know the certain ways in which people are brought to faith. Right? Uh, so I can't speak outside of those bounds. Now, I would also say that that then has no impact on like how we are to live and be as Christians, because we're given a specific set of things to do, right? Um, Like another good example of that is, do you think the Holy Spirit can bring somebody to faith outside of the means prescribed to the Church of Christ in the Bible? Well, yeah, of course, he's God, right? Right. Does that then mean that we do anything different as the church? No, right? And so it isn't that we're limiting God when we say this stuff. It's that, look, this is what he's told me to do. This is what he's told me to put my trust in, my faith in, right? That's why he gave us physical rituals like baptism and the Lord's Supper. So we had visual, tangible things that we could hold on to, refer to, and utilize in order to bring about faith in a promise that would be now visible to you. That doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit could visit somebody in Indonesia who's never heard about Jesus 
and somehow create faith in them, he could totally do that as part of being God. I'm not going to put my hope in that, though. He's just going to do what he's going to do, right? I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do in my obedience as a follower of Jesus. Right? Well, even in our lesson today with Philip and the eunuch, that, that was a God thing that probably met. Right, right. And, and even if, uh, you know, well, and then, right, because you have the Holy Spirit sort of whisks Philip yeah. away afterwards. So maybe, you know, you'll have some weird experience when you're, you know, out doing something, all of a sudden you just appear as somebody you've never met before, <laughs> and they're reading Isaiah, and God's like, you need to go tell them that's about me, it's about Jesus. Like, okay. <laughs> and then when it's done, you're just right back to where you were before. Right? I mean, the Holy Spirit can do that. He wants to. Far be it for me to say he can. Right? But we don't then make our policies about the way that we do things depend on those sorts of experiences. Right? Or maybe you've read a book about um, uh, you've read a book about like somebody who has a vision of heaven. Right? So maybe they maybe they died and they were resuscitated. They said they have a vision of heaven and they describe it and all this stuff. Typically, our response to that as Lutherans is, it, I have no reason to doubt what the person is saying. But it doesn't really change anything about what the church is supposed to do. Right? And possibly, in some cases, especially if it's really hard to understand, given what Paul says about speaking in tongues, it was probably just for you. I mean, so it isn't that we discount those things. But kind of in tandem with this theme and creation of our God being someone who brings disorder into order, that's what the church is for God's plan of salvation in the world, right? Just the ordered institution that he set up through his disciples in order to carry out his plan of spreading the message of the gospel. Now, he himself is not limited by the way he set those up, but we are, right? And so that's what we do. Okay. As it's almost time, we're going to start on our actual thing for today, um, as per usual. Uh, open up to 137 in your small catechisms, page 137. And before we get into angels, we have to have a discussion about body and soul. All right, question, we're looking at question 119 there on the middle 137. What does it mean that God has given me both a body and a soul? Someone want to read the sentence underneath there for us? I am not only a body, I am not only a soul, I am a body into which God has breathed. All right, right, Genesis 2, 7. The Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Now, something that may be a little lost in translation there is the Hebrew word for breath is the same word for spirit, okay? ruach. And so that's understood as the birth of the spirit or the soul when the Lord breathes life into the dust of the earth okay uh, and then ecclesiastes ecclesiastes 11 5 there as you do not know the way the spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child so you do not know the work of god who makes everything all right now what's the significance of having a body and a soul so this was a big deal for a long time in the church because the prevailing philosophy that came from the Greek culture and the ancient Greek culture was that all of the universe was a dualism of body, matter, and soul or spirit. And in that context, what was the goal of the soul in life? Does anybody know? To transcend the body. To transcend the body, right? To leave matter behind because matter was sort of like base and lesser while the soul and spirit were of a higher order, okay? And the reason that that became, that, that sort of infiltrated the church for a long time, and even still has ramifications today, that people kind of naturally fall into that when they talk about things like body and soul. 
But the scriptures have a major disagreement with that in that there's no value over and above given to either. So it isn't that matter is great and spirit is bad or that spirit is great and matter is bad. That they're both good and the same type of good. So you're not like shuffling off this mortal coil and leaving your meat sack behind. Right? Um, because it's more your body is you. It's part of you. Like when we talk about I am in an existential sense, you're not just referring to like the mind that's floating above your body or the soul, but both according to scripture. Right? Now, why would that be significant? We ought to treat our body with respect, right? And care. Yeah. Treat our body with respect and care. There's a couple of debates going on in our culture right now that this has a profound impact on. What does that mean about your created self? Well, this our soul lives on after death. Uh, you know, at least Christians believe that. Sure. So <clears throat> that's true, but that's not what I was going for. Um, so what I'm going for the way he wants us. It's the way that he wants you to be, not just in soul, but in body, right? So the scriptures don't separate those two things, which means that you can't have an internal identity that isn't reflective of your body. So, for example, I can't say I'm a female trapped in a male's body because the scriptures puts those things together your body and your soul are what make you you, not just your soul, right? So the assumption that's being made by a statement like that is the internal me is correct and the external me is wrong. How can that be? If both of those are what make you you and both of those things were made by God, intentionally so. Not, not going down the transgender line, but how would that statement um, makes sense of somebody who was born with an extra chromosome, like an XXY or XXYY. Like a hermaphrodite? Not necessarily that, but um, uh, they, they, they call it like a super male. Um, sure. And it's XYY. It, it's, it's, they, they just happen to get an extra um, gender chromosome sure. um, in, in birth. It's a mutation. Yeah, I mean, so it would be the same as, as most other mutations in birth, but like it would, I mean, a, like a congenital defect is also a mutation. It's just a, a failure to make what is what standardly is made by the DNA, right? Um, and so we'd say that's an effect of sin. We can't hear you fast. Huh? We can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Um, so the question was like, what about people who are born with an extra X chromosome or extra Y chromosome? Um, and we usually chalk those things up to the effects of sin and creation, right? So that sin causes the way things are designed by God not to function the way they normally would. But that's a different sort of question than an existential one between a sense of self apart from your body, right? Um, so like everybody in here has something wrong with their body, right? Whether it's self-inflicted or something you inherited, there's something wrong with your body, right? Um, the response to that being wrong is not, well, that's not me. I'm the thing that's like inhabiting the body. I'm not the body, right? Which is sort of the philosophy that you have to assume in order to make statements like that. And the scriptures are saying, no, you are both together. That's you, not you're the thing inside the body. Like you're all of it. So we hand over here, Mike. Yeah, it's, I think this is a, um, this is one of those, I think, issues, it's very complicated, but it's a real challenge to the Christian church to figure out what its approach is going to be, and A, to be compassionate, number one, but so we have to sort of take ownership in some respects of forcing people into particular roles in this world, when if the Lord made them that way, it's okay to do that. Well, you know, it's okay to, to not fit in what society define, defines as a role, right? Sure. 
it, the, the, the Lord made creation and all of its very wonder. And that also can happen for humans too. Sure. Right? And we have to be, it's, I think it's a challenge for us living in a sinful world that defines gender roles in particular ways, right? To not accept people for who they are, whatever they are. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I mean that that that's a good not distinction force them to, to make. make a, not force them to say, "I'm wrong." You right. know what I mean? Well, it bears it bears mentioning the distinction in this particular case of, like, what does the scripture actually ascribe to masculinity and femininity, and those concepts as opposed to what we do? Let's so like, let's say you have a son who likes the color pink. What we should not be doing is then encouraging them to think that that means they're not a boy, which is what our culture does, right? What we should be doing is saying, oh, that's great that you like pink, no problem. And talk like, so this is where a really good example of where the church should do itself a favor and talk about the things that it is and rather than the things that it's not, right? And that's what this is right here, is that you can talk about with your son, like you may hear from some of your friends or some people in this culture, that that means that you're not a boy, untrue, right? God has made you the way you are intentionally, and he loves you as you are, right? And so you're you're sort of redefining that in a compassionate sense by what God is saying rather than what we're saying. Because most of the, the real messy stuff that we're dealing with is sort of a result and reaction to, like, defining people by things they're not or in a wrong way, based on like human conception versus the way God designs things. Or reacting to them because they, because they make, because it's us, our own discomfort, right? Of not, we want to, see, our mind wants to see certain things. And when what's presented to us is something other than what's, what we're comfortable with, then we react negatively. Sure, and sure. We, I mean, and there it's is, a challenge. It's a challenge. And, and that itself is kind of a complicated oh. issue because the scriptures do, do describe certain things in negative terms. But the like going back to what we're talking about with the principalities and powers is like that person is never your opponent, right? They're being afflicted by sin in a particular way that maybe you don't share, but like you, they are afflicted by sin. And so, what's the answer for them as well as for you? Let me tell you about Jesus, right? And let me tell you the way God loves you and sees you as you are, right? One of the most powerful statements I've heard from somebody talking about this identity crisis stuff is that they, so this person was transgender to the whole thing. After he was married and had kids, he decided that he was a, a woman trapped in a man's body, had the surgery, went all the way. Okay? And then found after 10, 15 years that it didn't change his self-perception, right? And so he detransitioned. There's quite a few people that do that. Uh, you don't hear about them because they're intentionally, they don't want people to hear from those people. But one of the things that he does, he set up a thing where he, he talks to people who deal with the sort of identity crisis that is transgenderism. And they go through all the stuff that he did. And he said, the one question he asks them that always, they always have a specific answer to is what happened to you to make you hate yourself, to make you reject who you are. Okay. Uh, and what the truth is in pointing that out isn't that, well, this person's super messed up and I'm not super messed up. It is that they were led to believe that whatever the way they are, whether it's because of societal misconceptions about who they are and what they should be, or abuse or whatever it was, that they were unsatisfied with themselves or they were led to believe to be unsatisfied with themselves, right? So our job is actually to heal that wound by pointing them to Christ, right? who loves them perfectly the way they ought to be loved, right? Rejecting the, the, uh, the actions and choices, just like he does that with you, right? There are certain choices and actions that you participate in, that I participate in, and he says, no, that's not good. Please come back to me for your own sake. But also where the world causes harm, he causes evil. Right? Anyways, all right. Well... <laughs> We have two minutes. We almost got through number one. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Let's just read those scriptures there about what the significance of it is. 
Um, so we read 127 already, God created man as own image, and image, the reflected image of God is both in male and female, right, so that's worth pointing out there. Uh, and then um, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. I got it if you want to read. Yeah, go for it. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Okay, so that's perhaps one of the most anti-American Christian sentiments there is in the Bible. <laughs> you are not your own, right? And when we talk about when we say you are not your own, that doesn't mean the soul. It means all of you, soul, body, everything, right? That you belong to Christ. And we soften the language of scripture up a lot on this particular topic. The Greek word that's often used when you hear servants is doulos, which means slave. So Luther posited that we are never a free creature in, a, in the sense that we're actually not created to be free, at least not in the way that we think of it in Western society, right? So uh, if you're somebody who suffers from addiction or you have a compulsive sin behavior that you're trying really hard to stop, do you feel particularly free when you do that? No, right? Most of the people who are in those situations describe themselves as being prisoners, prisoners of their own desires, their own inclinations, right? So Luther posits that you're either, we're like a horse with one of two riders, right? Either Satan is, is riding and he's got the bridle and he's leading where we go, or Jesus is. Right, and we, we talk about faith being a gift. So the good decisions we make and the resisting temptation that we make, those come from Christ, right? And so the, the freedom of the Christian is actually freedom to serve Jesus. Right, because the Western idea of freedom was the problem from the very beginning. You'll be free, you'll be able to see what's good and evil and make your own choices just like God. And what's the problem? We, we can't do that, right? As all of human history is testing to. Okay. Okay. Well, it looks like we'll probably need a whole other class to go through this, these uh, three questions. Um, but it is noon, so I don't want to keep you too long. Uh, so let's uh, let's close with the word of prayer, and uh, we'll use the same outline next week. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you created us, that you created us as we are, and that even when we fell into sin, you still loved us, loved us enough to send Jesus to intercede to bear the penalty of our sins and misdeeds and pronounce us righteous, wrapped in his righteousness and none of our own. Grant us compassion as we go out into the world of people hurting from the effects of sin, from people who are afraid and do not know of the unconditional love that you have for them in Jesus. Help give us opportunity and to give us the words to say, the things to do in those opportunities, to bring that love to bear so that they too know that they are loved by God. An unconditional love that blots out all of their transgressions and wraps them in your perfect robe of righteousness. Grant us your aid as we do this this week. Watch over us. And we ask that you be with our fellow brothers and sisters of this congregation who are undergoing hardships of any kind, whether it be grief or ailments, lift them up and we place them into your care. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, everyone. Thank you.